And now we will move to the session one, so theme one of this uh, symposium on new governance challenges in the lunar and cislunar domains. Thank you for your patience. So theme one uh, on new governance challenges in the lunar and cislunar domain will investigate uh, all the new governance challenges that are raised uh, by these future lunar and cislunar missions. Uh, and we will try to look at, at very specific, very important topics that are still being explored, uh, but that will be truly at the core of um, future lunar missions. Uh, and for instance, we will uh, mention the use of nuclear power sources on the moon, which will be important to sustain uh, long-term human presence on the moon, the protection of heritage sites, and in other words, space archaeology, as well as innovative forms of multilateral engagement, and in particular, the Artemis Accords uh, that have a, a prominent place in the future governance of, in particular, missions led by the United States and American allies. Um, and this session will be composed of an opening keynote followed by a panel session. So let me first introduce the session's keynote speaker, who will provide us with an overview of the latest major milestone in international norms development, what I mentioned, the US-led Artemis Accords. Our first speaker, Mr. Garvey McIntosh, is currently the NASA Asia representatives based at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. In this capacity, he is responsible for the coordination of NASA programs and interests in Japan and other countries in the Asia-Pacific region. He also works with regional aerospace officials on key programs and serves as point of contact for NASA-related meetings and travel. Since joining NASA in the Office of International and Interagency Relations in 2003, Garvey has accumulated a broad range of experience. While in OOIR, he has negotiated and completed agreements with the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and NASA's other international partners on the Space Shuttle, International Space Station, High Energy Physics, and Astronomy. So, as you understand from this description, we are extremely fortunate to have Garvey here with us today, and no one can explain the Artemis Accords and what it entails better than him. So I would like to now give the floor uh, to Garvey for his presentation on the Artemis Accords. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay in there? Perfect. Yeah, great. So uh, uh, thanks everybody for uh, inviting me here today. I'm excited about talking about the Artemis Accords. Um, I was watching earlier and, and, and uh, um, Saki-san uh, very much talked about uh, the Artemis program, so I don't have to go much too much into the Artemis program. Just wanted to say that, you know, we're very, very excited about the opportunities of return to the moon in a sustainable way and working with many international and commercial partners, in particular our friends here in Japan. And I don't have to talk about that because I just said Saki-san talked um, about the different um, uh, where we are in terms of already signing an agreement on Gateway and, and our ongoing discussions in many different areas, including, as you mentioned, the possibility of seeing a Japanese astronaut uh, walk on the moon one day. So my, my goal here is to talk uh, primarily about the Artemis Accords and um, kind of talk more into detail about what those accords are and um, after that, answer your questions. So I can't see my slides, but next slide. Uh, let me check with the team here. No, so could you share your slides? Or... Oh, I didn't prepare my slides. I sent them. I was ah, okay. To... Could you please share Garvey's slides, please? Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so uh, I'll just kind of go talk. My first slide is talks a little bit about Artemis. Like I said, um, a lot of it's already been talked about today. Um, the Artemis uh, program 
um, is NASA's program to return uh, to the moon as a precursor, precursor to eventual missions, human missions to Mars. Uh, we want to do that, as I said, in a sustainable way. Uh, you know, we've the basic premise of that is we want to have uh, the first woman and the next person of color uh, um, walk on the moon one day. And, and that comes um, from our approach to have a lot of diversity. Um, both gender diversity and, and, and diversity with different countries and different kinds of people. Um, the Artemis Oil program was a very great program um, and kind of put NASA on the map and, and helped us to be who we are today. But it wasn't very diverse in terms of uh, gender equality and that sort of thing. And so um, we want to make it um, a very diverse program. Next slide. Uh, we can just go on to that. And so I'll talk a little bit about the Artemis Accords. Um, I think the first overarching the next one please the first overarching uh, principle of Artemis is that um, you know as I mentioned before we want to land the first woman and the first person of color um, and and really go back to the moon in a sustainable way um, we want to um, have many countries and many private sectors uh, being part of the Artemis program um, and but we really thought that um, you know the basis of our uh, outer space activities, is based upon the um, Outer Space Treaty. Um, but we, we really felt that the Artemis, we needed something to go maybe a little bit one step deeper. And so we developed the Artemis Accords. Um, and that um, includes um, different activities we want to continue, like the Registration Convention and other multilateral agreements to create a safe and transparent environment that facilitates exploration and science for all of humanity to enjoy. And, I, and, I, and um, Sasaki-san mentioned that we started off uh, with eight uh, uh, countries um, a part of the Artemis Accords, eight signatory countries, and we've expanded that to 15 now. Um, and so we have kind of broad, uh, many different diff types of countries, countries who are very involved in lunar exploration, countries that want to be more involved in lunar exploration, and, and countries just think that we need a set of guiding principles and rules of the road, if you will, to make sure that we do have this safe environment uh, for lunar exploration. Next slide. So the first one is is, is pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, it's one. It's one. We want to make sure that we do use uh, um, our exploration activities for just that peaceful purposes. Um, the Artemis uh, International Cooperation on Artemis is not intended to bolster any space exploration, but to enhance uh, peaceful relations between nation between nations. And we really think that the Artemis Accords, um, um, using the tenets of the Outer Space Treaty should reinforce the um, idea that when we do space exploration, that we should do that uh, working together or uh, working with one another in a peace and sustainable way. Uh, next slide. And so I think that as I go through the Artemis, the different um, uh, provisions of the Artemis Accords, that you'll see that um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, they're not um, difficult to understand. Um, for example, the next one is transparency. Um, it, it's pretty simple that, um, you know, we want to make sure that, um, that we do things in a, in a transparent na in, um, nature and that uh, we, uh, that nations working together would do so uh, as one, um, describing their own policies and plans in a transparent manner and that they do that um, together and we do that and to avoid conflict. Um, we think when we go back to the moon and, and eventually on the Mars, that the more we know about what each other is doing, uh, the more we can avoid conflict. So I think the overall um, um, understanding of the transparency is that we want to do that, avoid conflict and just let each other know what we're doing so that we can um, do it together and in a safe and sustainable way. Next slide. And so the next one is interoperability. And so interoperability is, um, is actually not in the outer, outer Space Treaty, but we think interoperability is also important to maintain a peace, um, so stability as we, as we go uh, forward to the moon. Um, interoperability could, could be uh, person to person or uh, astronaut to astronaut, but it would also be systems talking to each other. And so the, we really think that interoperability of systems is critical to that safe and robust space exploration, sustainable environment that we'd like to um, create. 
And so the Artemis Accords calls on partner nations to utilize um, op open international standards to develop new standards when necessary and strive to support interoperability to the greatest extent possible um, and practical. So it's pretty self-explanatory that um, we want to have people um, interoperably and working together. And we also want to have our systems talking to each other to reinforce uh, the tenets of the Outer Space Treaty and also to avoid conflict and make sure that the activities that are being undertaken on the lunar surface um, at first and maybe other um, planetary bodies in the future are done um, peacefully. Next slide. And so like this one is also pretty self-explanatory and, and it's um, emergency assistance. I think that's pretty much that we want to make sure that when we um, are on the lunar surface, that if someone is in distress, if um, we if someone needs help, that we're helping each other. And uh, NASA and our partner nations commit to taking all reasonable steps to render assistance to astronauts um, in the set in distress. And so um, and, and, and providing emergency assistance in those in need is a cornerstone of any responsible uh, civil space program. Therefore, the Artemis Accords reinforce NASA and partner nations commitment to the agreement on the rescue of astronauts, the return of astronauts, and the return of objects launched into outer space. And additionally, under the Accords, NASA and partner nations commit to taking all reasonable steps to helping uh, astronauts or you know um, people that are on the moon and, and, and that are in distress. So I think as, as the other, uh, um, provisions under the um, Artemis Accords. This one is also self-explanatory and kind of reinforces the desire for NASA um, when we um, go through the U.S.-led Artemis program that we do so peacefully. Next slide. And so the registration of art um, artifacts or, or space objects. Uh, the Artemis Accords reinforces the critical nature of registration and urges any partner which is already a member of the Registration Convention to join so as soon as practical. And so, uh, you know, registration is, 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 is key toward creating a safe and sustainable environment um, in space and to conduct public and private um, activities uh, without uh, proper registration, coordination to avoid harm or interference uh, cannot take place. So um, this one also is pretty uh, self-explanatory is that we want to make sure that, you know, we're to, to make sure that we create that peaceful environment, that we're talking to each other and that we're registrating what we're doing. And we're just making sure that we're um, making sure that we're talking to each other in a, in a peace and um, peaceful in a, in, a, in a peaceful way. Next slide. Uh, release of scientific data. As I mentioned in some of the other um, uh, discussions that this release of scientific data is not actually uh, listed in the Outer Space Treaty. But um, NASA, as an as an um, government organization, has always been committed to um, timely, full, and open sharing of scientific data. And so um, scientific data um, can be downloaded, the, the, the data that NASA satellites, um, uh, uh, the, from NASA satellites can be downloaded um, on uh, the internet if you have it. And so we're all, we've always been committed to making sure that our our um, data from our satellites are, is free and open. And we like to try to create that one uh, when we go back to the lunar surface. And so um, Artemis Accord partners, we hopefully, the ones that join the Artemis Accords will agree to follow NASA's example, releasing their scientific data publicly to ensure that the entire world can benefit from the Artemis joining of exploration and discovery. So as I mentioned before, uh, this one goes a little bit uh, further than already um, listed or uh, mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty, but we really, really feel that as we um, go back uh, to the lunar surface and eventually onto Mars and to do so pace peacefully, we need to make sure that, um, that we're um, releasing data and making sure that that's open to anyone that wants to um, partake in it and benefit from it. Next slide. And so the next one is protecting heritage, heritage sites. So this one um, is a little bit vague um, because um, what a historic site um, protecting, what a, um, a heritage site is, is really not defined. Um, and then um, 
And so, um, but we know that, you know, we have many um, heritage, uh, um, heritage historic sites here on earth. And so we kind of know what those are. And so we think that historic sites, um, similar to here on earth, she preached pre protected um, in space or on the lunar surface. So, um, so historic sites and artifacts will be just as important in space as they are here on earth. And so the Artemis Accords, um, um, NASA at least, under the Artemis Accords, uh, commits to protection of Caribbean and artifact sites with historic value. And we hope that the other um, partners that join us on the Artemis Accords will do that as well. Next slide. And, um, you know, this one has a little bit of economic value, and these are um, space resources. And so um, we really feel that, you know, for the commercial value of going back to the moon, that, you know, if you do um, extract resources, um, you should have the ability to do so and utilize those resources on the moon or Mars or asteroids. And it would be um, also uh, critical to safe and sustainable space exploration. And so the Artemis Accords reinforces that space resource extraction and um, utilization can and will be conducted under the auspices of the Outer Space, Outer Space Treaty as well. And so, um, you know, this, like I said, has some economic value as well, but we really feel that, you know, um, when you do extract resources, you should be able to um, extract them and utilize them as well. Next slide. And so um, I believe this is the last one um, under the um, Artemis Accords and that, oh, second to the last one, sorry, that's a de deconfliction of activities and, and avoiding harmful in interference. And it's an important principle of the Artemis Space Treaty, which is implemented under the Artemis Accords. And specifically um, via the um, Artemis Accords, NASA and partner nations will determine the area in which harmful in interference from any activity can occur. Um, and so we, we came up with the idea of safe zones that nations will be obligated to provide public information regarding the location and general nature of their operations and to coordinate with any entity that enters the area to avoid harmful interference. So this also um, underlines the um, principle of the Artemis Accords in um, maintaining that um, safe um, environment um, where we're working together, whether it's on the moon or eventually on Mars. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And so the final one, um, I think this will um, be very popular in Japan, and that's orbital debris and spacecraft disposal. Um, you know, we as humans have contributed to the orbital debris problem, um, and we really feel like this would should be reinforced under the Artemis Accords, meaning that to preserve that and continue that safe and sustainable environment, and that we should, uh, whatever we take up with us, we should have a way to dispose it and dispose of it safely so that it doesn't harm other people's spacecraft or, you know, and get in the way of, of maybe different um, activities that need to happen in space in the future. So NASA and other partner nations will agree to plan for the mitigation of orbit debris, including the safe, timely, and efficient passivation and disposal of spacecraft at the end of their missions. So that's um, the... So that's, that's the last one of, of the Artemis course, I believe. And so... Um, I just wanted to uh, end by saying that um, I think the the, um, the principles of Artemis Accords are pretty safe and sound. It's pretty, um, it's pretty safe. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, meaning that, um, you know, when we go back to the moon, and we're going to go back to the moon, as, as Pakistan and many others said earlier, uh, pretty soon, that we need to have some guiding principles, the, some rules of the roads. And we think they're pretty clear in the Artemis Accords, and we're very happy that you know, we started off with eight countries and now we have 15 and we expect we've talked to many con other countries that are interested in joining the Artemis Accords in the future as well. And so we really feel like this is um, a great opportunity to create that environment where everybody's clear about how to make sure that going back to lunar surface and eventually to Mars and other places is done uh, peacefully. And that was kind of the main uh, driver um, we felt like the Outer Space Treaty was there and um, it addressed some of these, but it didn't go quite far enough. And so, you know, as the lead for the Artemis program, we really tried to take the lead on the Artemis Accords as well. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to any questions that you have and
looking forward to the next speakers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Garvey, for, for this great presentation. And I think you, you clarified um, many very important points, um, in particular the fact that the Artemis Accords are sometimes criticized as being an American initiative apart from international law. And, and I think it was, it was really interesting how you presented them by explaining and by linking them to actual provisions of international law and, and explaining that it's, it's, it's a way to reemphasize very important principles of international law. And, and you said that the heritage is, is a bit a vague, uh, I would say, uh, aspect, and, and that's specifically why we have a great expert on this specific topic in the panel, and we'll discuss uh, this issue. Uh, because you have been really perfect with the time, I think I can uh, ask you one question uh, that, that we received. So, as I said, you linked with international space law treaties, but there is one that is indeed absent uh, from the list, which is the Moon Agreement. And, and in fact, um, so Andrew Sutter, uh, one of our viewers, uh, quote the um, April 2020 executive order uh, during the Trump administration that explains that the United States does not consider the Moon Agreement to be an effective or necessary instrument to guide nation state regarding the promotion of commercial participation in long-term exploration, scientific discovery and use of the Moon, Mars or, the, or other celestial bodies. So if you don't accept the Moon Agreement as a, as a guideline, I would say, how do you ensure that what will be done in the Moon will really benefit the whole of humankind, which is the, the spirit, I would say, of the Moon Agreement, and not just a few nations and corporations that would align with the U.S. vision? I mean, that's, that's a great question. Oh, sorry. And that, that's a great question, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a, a lawyer by background, so, um, so I... I have to apologize that from from the get go. I'm not as 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 um as, uh, familiar with the Moon Agreement, but um, I, I just will say that um, you know there's no way to ensure that um, everybody will um, you know under kind of maintain the, the the use of the Moon for peace purposes. I, I guess there's no way to ensure. And this is my own personal opinion, and don't you know say this is a massive opinion. But I think that you know. Um, one of the good things about, um, you know, I used to, when I was growing up, I, when I was in grad school, I, I worked at the Chemical Weapons Convention and uh, for, as an intern for about nine months in The Hague. And so, um, you know, the thing about it was a lot of the countries um, had chemical weapons and they were disposing them, but there are many countries that belong to the Chemical Weapons Convention that um, had no chemical weapons, but they were joining because they wanted to make sure that they wanted the benefits from, you know, chemical technologies, but also they wanted to make sure that people we wanted to be at the table to make sure that um, people were not using them for um, non-peaceful purposes or, you know, using weapons against, you know, different countries or different people and everything. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that we want to do by the Artemis Accords is to set that set of norms. I think that if you have a set of norms and everybody agrees that, you know, this is how you're going to do something, and this is the normal way to do it. You know, this is not, I think if you have kind of that momentum and you have enough countries that are, you know, that agree to it, that um, being outside of that um, could be kind of, you know, not in your best interest. And so, um, you know, with the Artemis Accords, one thing we're trying to do is just kind of set that set of norms. I think if you look at the Artemis Accords, they're pretty self-explanatory, and all of them, kind of do peaceful. So if every if you have a large set of country, now we have 15, in the future we have more, um, who agree that these set of norms are what we need to do when we go back to the lunar surface, and we need to do this in this way to make sure that we keep the activities on the lunar surface in a peaceful way, that anybody outside of that, anybody that tries to do it for non-peaceful purpose, be kind of outside of that and outside of the set of norms that are being established by a strong set of com countries. And that's also very challenging for uh, for many countries to do that because you're kind of the pariah per se. So um, that's what we try to do about our, the Artemis Accords. And we're hoping, we're, like I said, discussions with many countries to also join. So I think we're building that momentum to make sure that when we do go back to the lunar surface, that enough countries agree that we need to do it in this peaceful world way. And we feel like that that will um, create that set of norms that other countries will also abide by that as well. 
Thank you very much. And so now let, let's move to the panel part of this session, and I will uh, introduce our great speakers uh, one by one, starting with one of my colleagues here at the University of Tokyo, Dr. Yuri Takaya, who is a visiting researcher at the Institute for Future Initiatives, uh, so co-hosting this event, working on space security and cyber security project, as well as lecturer at the National Defense Academy of Japan, providing a course on air and space law. Her major is in international space law, and her active research topics are the legal aspects of space security, space resource utilization, and cyber security. I think, uh, Takaya-san, I will introduce the, the other speakers and then you can go with your, your presentation. The second um, panelist joining uh, Garvey here is Professor Alice Gorman from Flinders University. Uh, Dr. Gorman is an internationally recognized leader in the field of space archaeology, and I'm sure a lot of you here are willing to discover what is space archaeology. Her research on space exploration has been featured in National Geographic, New Scientist, and Archaeology Magazine. She's a faculty member of the International Space University's Southern Hemisphere Space Program in Adelaide. Her great book that I recently read, Dr. Space Junk vs. the Universe, Archaeology and the Future, received numerous awards, so I strongly recommend you, you buy and read this book. Uh, she has worked extensively in indigenous heritage management, providing advice for mining industry, urban development, government departments, local council, and native title groups in various parts of Australia. Dr. Gorman, thank you very much for being with us today. And finally, last but not least, we have Mr. John Menkins from the Moon Village Association. John Menkins is president of Artemis Innovation Management Solutions and of Menkins Space Technology Incorporated and a director of solar space technology. He is the vice president of the Mund Village Association and a dean and professor at the online Kepler Space Institute. While at NASA and JPL, he held numerous positions, including chief technologist for human exploration and development of space at NASA headquarters, where he received the NASA Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal. And for those of you who are, like me, a space engineer, you will be really interested in hearing that Mr. Menkins is known for writing the definitions of the TRL, the technology readiness levels, and as the world leading expert in the field of space solar power. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for being here today. And uh, now we'll ask each of you to make, I would say, a five-minute uh, introductory talk on a specific topic, starting by Dr. Takaya on nuclear power sources on the moon uh, addressed from a, a legal and governance perspective. Dr. Takaya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kanta. Uh, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yuri Takaya. My presentation is about the use of nuclear power sources on the moon. As the outline shows you, I explored the applicability of existing legal instruments related to the NPS use and accidents on the moon. Introduction. Let's start with the background. This year, UN COPOS, a scientific and technical subcommittee, reconvened the NPS working group, considering the following background. The increasing number of the commercial entities involved in the use of NPS and the potential future use of nuclear reactors in the frame of long-term human installations. So it is very timely to consider the NPS use on the moon. First of all, NPS stands for nuclear power sources and there are two types of NPS. The goal of this presentation is to clarify whether or not the existing legal instruments apply to the NPS use and accidents on the moon, and what their legal challenges are. I studied the following legal instruments, which are UN Space Treaties, the 1992 NPS principles, the 2009 NPS Safety Framework, the 1986 Convention on Early Notification of Nuclear Accident, and the 1986 Convention on Assistance, in the case of a nuclear accident or a radiological emergency. As to the applicability of existing legal instruments, UN Space Treaties are applicable 
However, legal challenges remain in the case of NPS accidents on the moon or collision in Earth orbit and in the atmosphere. The second instrument is the 1992 NPS principles. The problem of the principles is in the limited scope of application. Compared with other UN space treaties, it lacks the wording of including the moon and other celestial bodies. From the perspective of treaty interpretation, the principles are not applicable to the NPS use on the moon. However, if we think the case of NPS equipped rover on the moon, it is not logical for the principle to apply to the rover until its landing on the moon and stops their application after landing there. So it needs to be considered to cover the NPS use on the moon. The third legal instrument is a 2009 NPS safety framework. This is more guidance-like instrument and does not apply to the NPS use on the moon for the protection of the moon environment. Then, let's see the IAEA Treaty, the 1986 Convention on Early Notification of a Nuclear Accident. It applies to the NPS accident on the moon. However, it excludes nuclear reactor type of NPS from its application. The second IAEA Treaty the 1986 Convention on Assistance in the Case of a Nuclear Accident or Radiological Emergency applies to the event of a nuclear accident or radiological emergency within its territory, jurisdiction, or control. It lacks clarification whether or not the NPS use on the moon fits in the scope of nuclear activities. Furthermore, it is vague that to what extent IAEA can respond to the accident by making appropriate resources, for example, experts, available on the moon. Therefore, the IAEA needs to be substantially involved in the regulation of the NPS use on the moon. In conclusion, some of the existing legal instruments apply to the NPS use on the moon. However, further legal efforts need to be made to enhance the safety on the use. Good news is that the NPS working group in STSC decided to extend its multi-year work plan to finalize the report in 2023 and proposed to establish a joint expert group and a cooperation between STSC and the IAEA. In sum, UN based discussion start now and we can pay attention to this issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this great presentation. I think it's it's perfect to address uh, the the theme of nuclear uh, sources, energy sources on the moon, after the the presentation, having this uh, very precise legal background, and now we know clearly the the framework we are talking about. Um, for this. Uh, second introductory speech, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Gorman to talk about heritage protection on the moon and and show to Garvey that no, it's not that unclear. <laughs> there are a lot of things to be said. The floor is yours, Dr. Gorman. Uh, thank you, and thank you so much for um, inviting me to be part of this fascinating panel. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge also their deep and ongoing cultural connections to their lands, waters and skies. And I extend my respects to the traditional owners of the various lands and countries that the audience is joining us from today. So whenever I talk to people about future plans for the moon, it's clear that the impacts of mining and other surface activities on the lunar environment are a major concern. And part of this are the impacts on natural and cultural heritage. Cultural heritage can be defined as places and objects from the past that communities in the present feel should be passed on to future generations. And access to cultural heritage has been defined as a human right, uh, according to the UNESCO Universal Decla Declaration on Cultural Diversity in 2001 and the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. 
The study of lunar cultural heritage was pioneered by my colleague, Professor Beth Flora O'Leary, um, over 20 years ago now. And a small group of space archaeologists, myself included, have been researching the nature of heritage values on the moon, how we would assess them, and what we can do to ensure that they survive. And I can assure Gavi that we have some uh, very precise and distinct um, directions uh, to follow on this that will work very well with the Artemis Accords. So there's currently around 110 locations where human material has uh, interacted with the moon, starting from Luna 2 in 1959. And as of March the 4th, uh, this year, there's going to be one more when a Chinese rocket impacts on the dark side of the, the far side of the moon. Most of these sites are from the US and USSR Russia, but other nations represented include uh, India, China, Israel and Japan. So these places effectively represent over 60 years of human engagement with the moon. None of them currently have any form of protection, although there are some objects that are registered under US uh, state heritage laws. So managing the heritage values of these places is going to be an important part of the sustainable use of the moon. Apollo 11, uh, the, the first human landing site on the moon, is, is probably one of the most famous, the most famous lunar heritage site. But I'd like to talk a little bit about a lesser known and very relevant example, which is about Japanese cultural heritage on the moon. There are actually four known locations of Japanese material and one unknown one. And this starts with the Heaton satellite spacecraft, which was launched in 1990. It re released the Hagoromo orbiter once it arrived at the moon and then hit and looped around the moon and into the Kordeliski dust clouds at L4 and L5 before being intentionally crashed onto the sur lunar surface in 1993. And Hagoromo fell out of orbit eventually, but as far as I'm aware, its final resting place is not actually known. A much more substantial um, and fascinating mission was the LEMI, which was launched from Tanigashima in 2007. This was composed of three orbiting spacecraft, the main one nicknamed Cayuga, after a lunar princess from folklore, and the two smaller ones were called uh, Okina and Una. Uh, Okina was a relay satellite, and both Okina and Una were used um, uh, as very long baseline to measure lunar gravity. Cayuga itself had 15 instruments and the mission produced uh, a comprehensive topographical map of the moon, a far side gravitational map, and the first optical observations of the inside of the Shackleton crater at the South Pole. Cayuga itself was intentionally crashed onto the moon's surface in 2009, uh, southeast of Gill Crater, and that in fact is my background image. This is one of the, the pictures taken by Cayuga as it uh, went forward into its final resting place on the lunar surface. So the archaeological sites, the heritage places formed by these missions, um, consists of the spacecraft, which we can presume are quite damaged and crushed by that impact, and the impact craters themselves, an actual part of the lunar environment which has been created by this interaction. A scientific question we can ask of places like this is how the impact craters formed by human artifacts differ from those caused by uh, natural meteorite impacts. These places have cultural significance for Japan, but also given that lunar material culture is dominated by the US and Russia, there are uncommon examples of another nation's lunar endeavors that represent the development of Japanese space technology. So this is just to give you a taste of what lunar heritage sites uh, can look like or consist of. I'm currently working with the Global um, Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, which is run from the Moon Village Association, to establish some principles and procedures so we can manage the heritage values of places like these. This involves defining the heritage values and then working out management options that can be integrated in a practical way with the needs of lunar surface operators. And these are going to build on the existing 2011 NASA guidelines to spacefaring entities for protecting US cultural heritage 
on the moon. The primary recommendation of these guidelines is setting up buffer zones around sites that will minimise the damage caused by dust transport on the fabric of these places. Um, there's also going to be procedures for sampling these sites for scientific study so that we can use what they tell us to better understand the impact of the lunar environment on human materials, which is going to be very useful for planning future installations and surface habitat. And these principles can be extended to any place in the solar system where human material culture has been left behind. Having these heritage principles is important because it ensures that the sites are retained for future scientific study and it maintains the attachments that various communities feel towards these places so that the moon really is for all of humanity and not just those that can afford to go there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really fascinating to to discover so what concretely is lunar heritage uh, and and thank you for trying to link with examples uh, in Japan. I'm sure our audience really appreciate that. Um, and so now our third uh, introductory uh, presentation uh, from John Menkins on uh, a very important um, element of the future governance of moon activities. Uh, the Moon Village Association and its principles and best practices. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just uh, going to go to, I hope, full screen. There we are. Can everyone see my slides? Quinn? Perfect, yes. Okay, very good. So I'd like to uh, begin with a quick overview on the Moon Village Association, uh, which was uh, uh, conceived uh, back in 2016 at a cafe in Paris uh, and was uh, formed in 2017. Uh, the whole idea of sustainability of lunar and cislunar activities is of great importance to the association, uh, which hopes to provide a, an international forum for uh, uh, coordination and discussion and communication relating to lunar activities among governments, uh, non-governmental actors uh, such as companies and universities, uh, NGOs and others. Uh, we made an initial effort to frame a set of principles to guide uh, human activities related to the moon in 2018 uh, and then updated those uh, in 2020, uh, the Moon Village Association Best Practices, which I'll summarize in a moment. Uh, and in 2021, uh, just a little over a year ago, uh, forming the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, uh, the GEXLA uh, that Dr. Gorman referred to a few moments ago. Uh, and we continue to develop a, a framework for international lunar activities working with a very wide spectrum of players from around the world. Uh, just to highlight uh, the, some of the, the best practices, and I think you'll immediately see the, uh, the, the uh, connecting uh, DNA, as it were, uh, from the, uh, these uh, best practices to the, uh, uh, the Artemis Accord statements uh, that uh, Garvey McIntosh uh, was describing in his keynote a few minutes ago. Uh, certainly, first and foremost, uh, the importance of international law as the overarching framework uh, for the conduct of lunar activities, uh, recommending that uh, all space actors involved in the moon and cislunar activities uh, should do so in accordance with the uh, applicable uh, international legal framework, including but not limited to the Outer Space Treaty, uh, the sharing of benefits going towards specifically the idea of space exploration and lunar activities as being to be, for the benefit of all uh, humanity. Uh, space actors are encouraged by the best practices to conduct their lunar activities in a manner that takes into account the interests of other space actors and benefits all countries and players. Uh, and here we're, we're very expressly more than just country to country cooperation more than government to government, uh, but encompassing 
uh, recommendations and uh, and guidance to uh, corporate or university or individual uh, space actors. Uh, the idea of avoiding harm that all space actors should uh, take whatever measures they can to whatever extent possible to avoid harming the lunar environment uh, or cis lunar space. And that comprises things like uh, leaving your trash behind or damaging uh, the lunar environment with space debris and so on. Uh, the overarching principle established uh, by the United Nations uh, for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities and that activities in the moon should be in line with those principles, those guidelines. Uh, and of course, that uh, recognizing that there are going to be significant private sector activities that private uh, space actors uh, should uh, promote the development of uh, lunar resources for the benefit uh, of humanity uh, and to, uh, uh, to pursue uh, the uh, emergence of a cislunar economy that benefits Earth. There are a number of other best practices uh, which uh, reflect some of the items in the Artemis Accords uh, which Garvey spoke to, uh, the sharing of information, uh, the uh, uh, practices associated with the development utilization of space resources, the resolution of disputes that might emerge, the registration of lunar activities, um, and uh, looking forward, the implementation and further development of best practices as itself a best practice, i.e., that there's not there there cannot be for uh, the moon and cisternary space a single set of best practices uh, and a single set of standards for governance, uh, but all of these have to continue to evolve and uh, to inform uh, lunar activities going forward. Since 2020, uh, in early 2021, the GEXLA, the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities was formed. It includes many stakeholders, uh, both governments and uh, non-governmental players, universities, uh, academia, individuals. Uh, the idea is through a collective peer-to-peer -peer discussion over um, almost two years to frame a set of rules of the road upon which there is a wide consensus uh, and this was the uh, what uh, Dr. Gorman was uh, specifically alluding to with regard to the specific subject of lunar heritage uh, and uh, the human heritage on the moon. The goal is to finish that first set of rules of the road by December of this year uh, and to present those to uh, the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and the COPUS. Um, and we would certainly welcome additional participation uh, from uh, uh, space actors, uh, companies, universities, academics, individuals uh, with an interest in the in the, in the uh, human activities on the moon from Japan. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, John, for this presentation. And so let's dive right uh, in the in the panel and the discussion, uh, starting with the the first theme. Uh, on nuclear uh, power sources on the moon. So the, the reason actually for uh, this theme is an announcement by NASA of plans to, to establish a nuclear power plant on the moon. Uh, Garvey, could you, could you tell us a bit about that? And so we have around 20 minutes for the, for the discussion. So I will ask each of you to make short answers, please. Garvey, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I don't know the latest on the plans. I know, you know, we made an announcement that that was our um, intention. Um, and uh, I think discussions are ongoing. No, no, nothing's been decided as of yet, as far as I know, in terms of specifics. So I'm sorry, I can't talk too much about that, Quentin. I just don't know the details. But I, I do know that um, discussions between, um, you know, space, obviously, I just want to just make one point that you know, within the U.S. government, um, uh, space, a lot of people maybe don't realize this so much all the time, that space is a lot bigger than NASA. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who have to, who, who, who are um, who are involved in, in the decision-making process. So, you know, when something uh, is important as that, 
Um, we'll have the National Space Council, the White House, we'll have the State Department. And so there's many different stakeholders there are um, discussing, uh, you know, nuclear activities, um, you know, in space or on the lunar surface. And so um, I don't have the latest in terms of developments on those discussions, but I know the discussions within the um, various stakeholders within the U.S. government are ongoing. Thank you very much. And now I would like to, to turn to Alice. So in, in your book, there are wonderful pages. So Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, I remind, remind the title. Um, you, you have wonderful pages about the emotional attachment of humans to the moon. And considering how emotional people can be about the debate on the use of nuclear power sources on Earth, um, do you think that this debate can be transposed to the, the context of the moon? Yes, I, I think that is a very good point. So um, we know that these things arouse strong feelings on Earth. And, and, you know, historically, Japan has had some very close encounters with, with huge environmental and social um, consequences. Um, and these things have happened in other countries as well. Um, so so I, I think uh, these, this is going to arouse some really interesting um, public reactions. Of course, there are already nuclear power sources on the moon. So the Apollo missions um, had, I think there's five RTGs on the moon, which generally use um, plutonium-283, which has a shortish half-life. That's very different from an actual nuclear reactor. So um, I... I, you know, having said that as well, there are actually RTGs spread throughout the solar system. It's it's not like we're looking at a a, a space that is is completely free of radioactive and, and fissive materials. That's not the case. But I do think, um, given that there's a very heightened public awareness of um, human impacts on lunar and other environments at the moment, that this is going to be something that will have to be very carefully managed. T talking about the, the management of nuclear energy, but also potentially other sensitive technologies, um, is it something that concerns you at the Moon Village Association? And is it um, a topic that you would like to, to investigate, in particular the use of nuclear power sources? And also, is there other technologies that you think could pose some safe, potential safety issues in future lunar plants? John. So I think, uh, in general, the uh, the Moon Village activities are not uh, targeting a particular technology per se. Uh, I think that in terms of the application of nuclear energy on the lunar surface or in, in cis lunar space, it certainly is a subject uh, that falls under a number of the Moon Village. Uh, best practices uh, that I uh, mentioned a few moments ago coming from a couple of years ago uh, and certainly are within the the realm of what the Gexla might be discussing uh, with the UN uh, in about a year. So uh, nuclear power is certainly one of those. I expect that the that the it's going to turn out to be a combination of the technology and the location because of the uh, the fact that the, that all not all locations on the moon are 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 uh, have identical interest either for science or for uh, potential resource extraction, the permanently shadowed regions are of tremendous interest from the standpoint of the potential for volatiles uh, in the ice, uh, and so uh, making sure those are not contaminated uh, would be an issue of significant concern in future operations. Um, other technologies, uh, if, for example, uh, the, the techniques used for the extraction of lunar ices uh, could either be uh, the, the ways that those are that the process is done either could leave the surrounding moon pristine or it might contaminate it, like open pit mining at images uh, from locations where that's undertaken. I think the latter is something that we absolutely want to avoid. Uh, and so we need to look at ways in which uh, lunar resources could be extracted and utilized, not just for the benefit of the uh, organization, company, or, or country doing it, but also to assure that those operations do not result in damage to the lunar environment. And this is absolutely a part of the, uh, the Moon Village best practices. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to turn to you, uh, Yuri. So you mentioned, and, and as other speakers mentioned, uh, the UN is uh, considering this issue uh, very seriously and with a, with a working group. Um, but the current plans, the major plans, let's say, for nuclear power on the moon are US and China. Do you think these uh, mechanisms that are being established by the UN and the involvement of the IAEA will be enough to have other countries also contribute to the discussion on the governance of nuclear power sources? Thank you. If we think about the NPS or nuclear reactor accident on Earth, yeah, IAEA apply international emergency preparedness and response framework, which is based on two conventions, which I introduced now. So then, uh, the military international community would be involved in this, uh, you know, uh, nuclear well, disaster management and so on. But the thing is, uh, IAEA would be, uh, will be, well, or must be involved substantially in the regulation of NPS on the moon. And that uh, is that also why the reason, the reason why uh, SDSC and IAEA uh, decided to establish a joint expert group. So we can pay attention to that. Thank you very much. And, and because John provided me with the, the perfect transition before talking about the protection of the environment, um, I would like to move to the second uh, theme that, that was addressed initially um, by Dr. Gorman. And um, I would like um, to, to, to build on what Dr. Gorman has already explained. Uh, I would like to ask all the panelists, so uh, Garvey, uh, John, Yuri, and, and Alice, how concretely, what are concrete actions for managing lunar heritage? So, so Alice, you gave us already a, a few examples. Um, so maybe starting with, with Garvey, um, does NASA actually consider specific practices, specific ways of protecting this heritage as highlighted in the Artemis Accords? Garvey, you're muted. I must, must admit that um... Um, I learned a lot from Allison today in terms of um, <laughs> world heritage, heritage sites, I mean, well, heritage sites you know, in space. So thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I'm not aware of uh, specific um, ways that we classify what heritage sites are. I know that uh, many of the things that um, 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 Alice, Alice talked about today, uh, you know, we consider of the possibility of becoming a World Heritage Site, but I, I don't know of any uh, classification as of right now of NASA deciding what exactly is and is not a heritage site at this time. So I could be wrong, and, and maybe some of the people on this panel, um, um, John and, and Alice, may know uh, more than me on that on this subject. But I'm not. I know that um, you know we have clarified within the Artemis Accords that we'd like to protect um, heritage sites, but I don't know at this time. Um, you know, we define exactly what those are. But some of the things that we already know um, will likely become heritage sites, but I don't know if we've actually determined those being heritage sites on a lunar surface uh, thus far. Thank you. John, do you have any anything you can share about the current discussions at MVA on, on actual practices? Uh, I, uh, so I think that uh, Alice might be better suited to, to speak to the question of the, those conversations. I would, however, throw in one thought, just because I am a, a techie uh, in this context. Uh, I do think that uh, it's hard to uh, manage what you can't find. Uh, and there are technologies like, like simple retro reflectors that could be used to tag all uniquely all of the most important heritage sites. Uh, and I think that uh, thinking about tagging such sites uh, and so that they are both precisely located and they could never be lost or no one could ever say, I, well, I didn't know I was about to, you know, pick up a flag from that mission. Well, if you tag, if you tag the site and you say everything within 50 meters of that rover is part of this heritage site, uh, then, then that's pretty clear going forward for the next millennium. So I think that there are techniques for physically tagging these objects, which will be, discernible, viewable from Earth, 
uh, it's essentially forever, and we should think about those. Alice, would you like to, to add something? Oh, well, I think John's idea is a fantastic one because this is all about location. And in fact, one, something we'll have to do uh, is make sure heritage locations are also integrated into lunar GIS systems. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of other things happening. So the, the GEGSLA, the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activity, um, is going to be producing some quite detailed um, guidelines, I guess, for how we do best protect heritage values. At this point in time, um, there has been no professional significance assessment done for any of the lunar sites at all. Although my colleague Beth Laura O'Leary has studied Apollo 11 um, extensively, and I think most people wouldn't have an issue with saying that has tremendous cultural significance. Uh, or, or at a global level, that would have cultural significance. Um, some of the other things afoot um, are the, the Hague building blocks um, raise the notion of an internationally endorsed heritage list. And a heritage list or register is a, a common mechanism on earth um, for protecting heritage. It's usually backed up by legislation, which in this case we can't have, but, but sort of a charter or guidelines uh, would serve just as well. Um, there are processes for defining things that have high levels of heritage as opposed to things which have much lower levels. So this provides you with flexibility and surface operations. So, so it's not going to be the case that everything has equal significance. So, but that work also lies in the future. Um, UNESCO is also um, interested in developing heritage principles for the moon, and some of these will probably be enacted through uh, ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, which advises UNESCO um, in heritage matters. Um, so it's quite likely that some kind of technical advisory capacity will be set up uh, through ICOMOS. Um, but for the moment, um, we, we kind of basically have to make sure that these sites aren't destroyed before somebody can do a full technical assessment on them. So in terms of our near-term lunar surface activities, the precautionary principle is very much one to follow because we are making decisions that are about future generations who, who, who have a right not to look back in 50 years and say, what the hell were they thinking? What happened to Apollo 11? What happened to all of these other sites? So that's kind of the responsibility we have with lunar heritage at the moment. I, I would like to ask maybe John um, about that, but do you think there could be um, some form of lunar economy around the management of this heritage site? Um, to put it simply, do you, do you imagine that business can be done from the management and, and the utilization of these sites? Um, I think that certainly the, the whole idea uh, that there are special locations on the moon, uh, whether they're uh, uh, a human artifact-based heritage site or a, a location of, of uh, profound uh, visual importance or uh, like the Grand Canyon in the United States. Um, I think that these locations can certainly uh, be part of future lunar tourism. And you can already see the emergence of of uh, interest in lunar tourism uh, uh, coming out of various uh, uh, activities and discussions. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, just to echo uh, Alice's uh, sentiment, I think that getting our arms around these future business activities, recognizing the prospective value uh, of, of various locations, either human heritage or of natural grandeur, uh, would be extremely important uh, during the next uh, 10 or 15 years before there's a McDonald's on the rim of Shackleton Crater. Indeed. And uh, actually, we, we have a... Nothing against McDonald's. Nothing against McDonald's. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, just we, we have a, a, a couple of questions, uh, in particular one on energy, so I will ask it later. But a final one on, on heritage. Um, most of our discussion is centered around Artemis Accords and plans mostly in the 
US and like-minded nations. Um, did you ever see any similar interest for the protection of heritage from other historical space powers uh, like Russia or China? Anyone? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that friend. I have to say that um, I haven't, um, I have had some discussions with Russian colleagues. There's um, an echo. Is that me or is that, oh, that sounds better. Um, in my experience, I haven't talked to a lot of other nations that have a, a sort of a strongly developed sensibility about their own lunar heritage. Uh, I mean, Russia and former USSR obviously has, um, you know, a huge amount of fascinating stuff on the moon. Um, most of the other um, major lunar faring uh, nations that I'm aware of sort of haven't really done anything much around this. So I would say the US, and particularly by centering heritage in the Artemis Accords, you know, is definitely taking a sort of global leadership role in um, in, 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 in making it, um, uh, you know, a strong point that this is not a little optional added extra thing that we can think about when we've done anything else. This actually is kind of central to how we conceive of our relationship to the moon. So I do hope, uh, well, I'm hoping Australia will sort of come on board with this stuff quite strongly as well, because we're a, 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 an acknowledged global leader in heritage management. So it would be great to get other nations to come to the party on this. Indeed, and unfortunately we are running out of time. I would have liked to, to keep this panel for longer. But uh, there is one question I, I want to, to take, and it's, it's a tech question, so may, maybe John can answer that. Um, someone asked, and, and that's true, that's the, on the premise of the discussion, we discuss on nuclear power sources, but someone simply asked, do we need nuclear power sources? Is solar power not enough for what we want to do on the moon? So I, I certainly think um, that for um, for tactical applications, such as we saw in uh, the in the use in the um, uh, the Mars rovers, uh, that there's a, a good opportunity for the use of nuclear energy, uh, for example, isotope power. I know there are efforts to develop uh, nuclear space nuclear reactor power systems. Uh, I think the 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 catch-22 there is going to be uh, associated with the availability of sunlight in the largely illuminated areas at the poles of the moon, which are of greatest interest for resource development uh, versus the scale of, of those operations. I, I, I see, uh, you know, discussions of hundreds of kilowatts being necessary as a starter kit to to do uh, resource extraction, I think that grows rapidly if, in fact, the resources of the moon are going to be uh, extracted, processed, and so on. So uh, I think there's, there's a potential role for space nuclear reactor power systems as sort of the ultimate backup, but I think it's never going to be only space nuclear reactor power systems. I think that the availability of, of sunlight at the polar regions is is too um, uh, too valuable, too useful, too too free to to uh, ever be fully replaced by um, systems that will inevitably cost uh, billions of dollars for for a hundred kilowatts. Thank you very much, and and yes, in, indeed, uh, obviously, it would probably never be. Uh, at least in the short term, the, the main source of energy on the moon. So we have to end our panel here. Uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, all of you in this panel, and, and I hope you will be able to attend uh, future events that we organize. Uh, I just want to, to give a message to people who send their questions in the, the Q&A box. Uh, thank you very much. We could not cover all the questions uh, that we received, but please do continue to, to send uh, questions in the, the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box uh, for the, the future panels. So again, thank you very much to all our panelists. We will definitely invite you again uh, for, for our future events. And uh, we will now have a break uh, for the next roughly 10 minutes, restarting at 3.30 Japan time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great.